Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you had a wonderful lunch, but you're still awake. The topic for today's discussion is from Boolean towards semantic retrieval models. I am Sanjuti, working as a data scientist at Unboxed. I am Arpan, and I am working at a, as an engineer at Unboxed. Right. So a little about Unboxed. What do we do? So we are a leading machine learning platform for e-commerce search, and we are present across verticals like uh, fashion, hardware, electronics, groceries, home improvements, and we are integrated with a lot of platforms, and this enables us to collect data at the scale of 1.5 billion interactions per month, which enables our machine learning algorithms. Some of the product offerings that we have at Unboxed, Site Search, which are the search services, and this powers the client websites, optimizes their queries, tracks CTR and CVR. The second offering we have is Intelligence Storefront. So this is a tool that we give to our merchandisers to control the merchandising, what promotions to put, what deals to control, and also analytics on that. The third offering we have is product recommendations. And this is where we use ML learned personalized models where we can recommend products depending on the user's intent, mentality, and tastes. Now, coming to the problem statement, Boolean retrieval, what is it, and why do we need semantic retrieval? Given a query, for example, black bomber jacket, what the search engine gives you is a parameter or a knob. It's called minimum match criteria. The minimum match criteria can be set at 100%, which means that match any of the tokens in the query term. And this corresponds to the union of the three tokens in the retrieve sets. Now, if we set the minimum match criteria to 0%, it's a very strict setting, which means retrieve the documents which have exactly these terms. And this represents the set intersection area that you see there. Now, if we set the minimum match criteria to a value in between, say, 60%, then it can match two of the three tokens. But in that case, a black bomber can be a good query, but we know that bomber jacket is probably more important here. So there is no way we can control the Boolean retrieval um, pertaining to the weights of the query tokens. And that's exactly why semantic retrieval is important. Now, there are two important relevance measures, as we all know. Precision, which is the number of relevant documents out of the retrieved set, which shows how accurate your results are showing. And recall, which is a coverage measure. Out of the total actual relevant documents, how, how many of them have you been able to retrieve? With semantic retrieval, we try to optimize these two parameters. The first part of the retrieval recognizes must-have tokens, which is a way to weigh the query tokens. And this makes the results set precise. But it might so happen, trying to make it precise, we have a low recall. The number of uh, retrieved documents can be really low. That's where the second part of the algorithm kicks in. And that is called the synonym augmenter. So finally, what we have in semantic retrieval is a query which is a disjun disjunction on an OR clause of the must-have tokens and their synonyms. I invite my friend here to now let us walk through the details of these algorithms. All right, thank you, Sanjuti. So what you see on the screen right now is a typical product description page. It has a product image and a lot of attributes that describe this image. Now, I have a question for all of you. The question is, which noun, according to you, best describes this product? Yeah, do I hear a jacket here? Right, so I am pretty sure that most of us would recognize this as a jacket, but the fashionistas among us might say that it is a bomber jacket. So this is exactly the intuition behind the must-have tokens. We tend to think of must-have tokens as the best representation of the product. Now, sometimes it so happens that the query issued is something like Christmas pajamas, when the catalog has other variations of it, like festive PJs or Christmas PJs, when the query does not exactly match the contents of the catalog. In search cases, to bridge the gap between the user query and the catalog, we make use of synonyms. So there are broadly three categories of synonyms that we make use of. The first are conventional synonyms, which, are, uh, which could be uh, something like pullovers and sweaters. Then there are very strongly related words, like printers, laser jet, inkjet, and so on. Then there are spelling or lemma variants. So this is a language phenomena where there are multiple ways of conveying the same thing. For example, wireless-enabled phone 
and phone with Wi-Fi, they convey the same thing, and they will lead to similar result set. Then Packers T. So Packers T and Green Bay Packers T-shirt, they, uh, they mean the same thing and will also lead to similar result sets. T and T-shirts are the lemma variants here. So now let's talk about the query understanding layer. For a query like black bomber jacket, uh, when it first hits the query understanding layer, it is first intercepted by the must-have token recognizer. In such case, a bomber jacket would be recognized as the must-have token. And then it will be augmented by synonyms like motorcycle jacket, biker jacket, hooded jacket, and so on. By doing so, we not only show one precise result, which is the reversible bomber jacket, we actually expand our result set into six highly relevant products. Now let's delve deeper into the nitty gritties of the generation of must-have tokens. We make use of the top queries from our domain query logs. The first step uh, in this generation is to generate a dependency parse of the queries. So dependency parser basically takes a sentence as an input, and it returns the syntactic relation, uh, the syntactic structure of the sentence. So in this case, it tells us that black is an adjective, and it is connected with jacket, which is a noun. And this relationship between them is the adjective modifier relationship. It also tells us that bomber, which is a noun, is connected with jacket, and it also describes jacket. This relationship between two nouns is called a compound relationship. So jacket is actually the root of both these relationships. Now, we observed that among our top queries, uh, more than 85% of them had the adjective modifier relationship, while more than 50% of our queries had the compound relationships. So we make a heavy use of these relationships. We are particularly interested in the root of the adjective modifier relationships. So in this case, uh, black jacket ha uh, have the adjective modifier relationships, and jacket is the root of it. So we will add jacket to the list of candidates. Then for bomber jacket, which are connected through the compound relationships, we will add both of them, uh, I mean, both the nouns as phrases to the list of candidates. Now, once we have this exhaustive and comprehensive set of must-have tokens, the next step is to assign importance to each of these candidates. Uh, we do so by assigning a score to each of them. The first, uh, uh, the, the score is dependent on uh, two major factors. So it's a composite score. The first factor here is to uh, look at the number of queries that each of these candidates will actually cover. And among all the queries that they cover, uh, we look at the queries where they actually are the root of A mod or are, are part of compound relationships. Now, let's be realistic. We will always get uh, grammatically incorrect queries like jacket, bomber, black, where dependency parser would tend to generate uh, incorrect dependency parse structures. In such cases, black might be added to the list of must-have tokens. But this is handled here because the count of the queries where they actually are the root of a mod or a compound relationships will be quite low. Now, my friend will uh, tell you about the synonym generation pipeline. Right, thanks. So now, the first part of the problem was to weigh the query tokens, figure out what are the important must-have tokens there. Once we have that, we move on to the second stage, the synonym generation. The first step here is to build a local corpus and a local corpus consists of the catalog and the click stream, the click query logs for a client or a particular domain. The second step is to train word vector embedding of this, and we will be talking about that in the next few slides. Once we have the empty list, how we generate synonyms is a two-pronged process. So we feed the list to a global corpus, open source English concept tools like ConceptNet and WordNet, and we get the candidates from there. The second step is to feed it to the local word to vector embedding and generate the neighborhood, the nearest neighbors of these uh, words. Now, sometimes it so happens that the context of the word is not established. So as a result, we might have different senses uh, called synsets across the board. So to figure out the correct sense of the word and to prune out the noisy ones, we uh, use an algorithm called word sense disambiguation. And we'll be talking about that in the next few slides. 
Finally, once we have the candidates, the winners, we apply spell correction and stemming to figure out the final synset. Now, language. So language has various nuances. It can be confusing. As you see here, a dad is standing in front of the ATM machine. The kid walks up to him, asks him, Dad, what are you doing? He says, just checking my balance. But did he mean that he was checking his posture with his hands high up in air, or was he talking about the amount of money in the ATM? So it is difficult to understand language. But nowadays, uh, there is a lot of tools which are generating so many mails and documents and texts that we need to teach a machine how to be able to classify these documents and cluster them. That's exactly where the word vector embedding helps. So it is a way of representation in a machine format of a vector of high dimensions which can embed lexical ambiguity, semantic relationships, and concepts. So this concept was uh, invented by Hinton, who said that there is, should be a distributed representation of symbols. For example, cat as a symbol means not much. But if we can add the neighborhood of cat and its different concepts, that might be more representative. And that is the intuition between word vector embeddings. It's a function. It's, it's a function where a word is represented by the contextual words or words in its nearest neighborhood. And the optimal dimensions ca uh, capture most of the nuances of the modeling, which is context, ambiguity, semantics, and different things. Now, there are two popular neural network architectures to learn this embedding. One is the CBAO models, where given a context, you're trying to predict the missing words. And the second architecture is KICBRA models, where given a word, you're trying to predict the context. For the product that we have released, we have used Google's word to vec algorithm, which is a combination of the CBAO and SkipRAM. To give you some examples of what it can do, so if you look at a keyword called jacket, and we look at the word vector embedding space, and we do PCA just to project it in a lower dimensional space to improve our understanding, what we see are different flavors of jacket evolving. So on one hand, you have bomber jacket, leather jacket, windbreakers. On the other hand, you have winter wear, like anorak jacket, puffer jackets. And the third type is cardigans, sweaters, and things like that. To give you another example, the word shoes has different concepts in the embedding space. So it can range from running shoes, sneakers, sportswear, to uh, flip-flops and sandals and uh, regular wear kind of shoes. So these are the different concepts of the word shoes. Now we use this word vector embedding, and we do it on the catalog space. That gives us the set of synonyms that you saw in the slides that Arpan explained. So for bomber jacket, we end up with biker jacket, motor jacket, and leather jacket as good recommendations for synonyms. Similarly, if you see the earrings and the nearest neighbor, you see the different stylings of earrings, drop earrings, hoop earrings, stud earrings, evolving from the catalog and also related products like necklaces and bracelets. Now, if you do the same operation in the user query space, it so happens that users are also looking uh, for synonyms like denim truckers and soft shell. If you do it on gloss, the different kinds of concepts of gloss evolve, like plumpers, lipsticks, lip liner, lip color, balms, etc. So, Having learned the word vector embedding, the second part of the application is to do word sense disambiguation. The word orange in fashion domain means a color. But if you feed it to an open source corpus like ConceptNet or WordNet, it's going to return you the four different senses of the word orange. First sense indicates color, the second one is fruit, third one is a tree, fourth one is a pigment. Now how do we teach a machine to pick the correct cluster here, which is the first one? That's where we can also use word vector embeddings. So we take the entire word cloud represented here, project it in the embedding space, take the vectors, and figure out the centroid. And then we measure the cosine similarity with the embedding vector of the original key, which is orange. And the one which minimizes that distance is the winner. So in this case, the winner is a color sunset, and we get good recommendations as synonyms like orange red, salmon, blonde, olive, all indicating colors. Now, to summarize the things that we explained here, um, firstly, we get a query. We do a dependency parsing of the query, uh, kind of scoring. That gives us the must-have tokens. 
We learn the word vector embeddings on a local corpus. We treat the MTs as keys and use the word vector embedding on the catalogs and on the click logs to generate the synonym candidates. We also use it as a key and fit it to an open source uh, concept net, word net, uh, APIs, and we figure out the synonym candidates, but we prune the noisy ones using word sense disambiguation. And finally, the query now becomes an R clause, a disjunction of empties and synonyms. And this is finally uh, fed to the EDIS Max Solar query. So we have written the custom solar plugins, which can convert this to a format that Solar understands. All right, so conclusions and future work. Since uh, dependency parser sits at the core of our must-have token generation, uh, we want to train our own dependency parser using, dependence, uh, using deep learning. And we intend to extend the must-have token and the synonym data set uh, from one client to other clients, and finally, over one domain. We intend to improve and simplify the vector algebra operations. So what I mean by that is just like Mikolov established gender as a vector in embedding space, we want to do the same for a synonymy vector. And we want to improve the training times for our word to vector training uh, by making use of MapReduce. And then finally, we want to implement a feedback mechanism to autocorrect the good synonym and must-have token pairs by automatically pruning out the noisy pairs. So currently, our accuracy sits at around 80%. We want to push it to 100% or as, as close to 100% as we can. Thank you for listening. We will take your questions now. Thank you so much. <laughs> questions for the speaker? Hi. Uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. Really impressive that you implemented all the stuff and have it running in production. Um, did you ever measure like how yeah how much slower queries get by the pre-processing because dependency parsing is very slow as far as I remember. Maybe for short queries not, but did you measure that or the performance impact? Right. So we we are hitting those uh, problems in production. So what we do is we train it offline. So we do the offline analysis on the top queries daily or at an hourly basis. We learn the dependency parse and the must-have tokens, and we put it in a cache. And that's how we can do the online part, because we did notice that the dependency parsing on an online path is quite slow. And that's uh, the timing solution for any latency issues that we might see. I didn't quite or didn't completely understand um, what you do on disambiguation. So uh, what we tried to show you is to expand the synonym candidate sets. So other than the local corpus, we also want to use open source tools like WordNet and ConceptNet. And that's where we are getting a lot of synonym candidates. But the word orange in fashion means color, and therefore applying uh, uh, synonyms of fruit wouldn't make sense there. So that is exactly where we do the uh, word sense uh, disambiguation. So we get the sin sets from WordNet, and then we iterate over each. And for each one, we look at the word cloud, and we take the local embeddings. And that's when we figure out the distance. So no, the orange fruit seems very far from what we are looking at. And this color seems more intuitive, because its distance is minimizing to the vector of orange. And that's how we kind of figure out the right sin set and take it forward. And uh, second question, did you somehow measure the improvement uh, of the of recall and precision you get by applying all these uh, methods? Definitely. So there are two ways uh, we are trying to do that. So a lot of it was manually generated, must have tokens or synonyms put in place. So after we moved to this automated method, there has been a huge uptake because a lot of clients we can uh, do in parallel. And we are trying to do A-B testing between this manually generated set and the automatic set. And we are seeing an improvement of 20% and up, depending on the client size and things like that. Any more questions? Um, so are you harvesting synonyms both from the corpus and uh, the query logs as well as WordNet? And yes. Yes. So on the 
sort of word embedding query log document based, um, it's very often that you'll find nearest neighbors that are that are really not the same ideas, but that are used in similar contexts, right? I think one of the speakers gave an example of like, you know, confirm and cancel tend to be used in, in a similar context and they're, they're very different words. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you end up pruning or dealing with um, these sort of false positives that you might find if you're if you're looking at nearest neighbors in an embedding space? Uh, right. So, so the way we are trying to solve that, and this is work in progress, is uh, we we use uh, some feedback mechanism now from humans, and we are trying to build a classifier on top of the synonym set generations. Right now, the accuracy is at eighty percent. But what we are trying to see is that this twenty percent and their feature vectors, and if we can do something like a relevance feedback, where we automatically reject the suggestions when it is uh, in the boundary cases. So that is something uh, which is work in progress, and that's how we plan to solve that problem. Okay. Uh, thank you, Arpan and uh, Sai Juti. Yeah. Uh, I think we can take a break for coffee. So again, we'll meet back in another 30 minutes. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. <laughs>